Okay. Broadcast. All right. Well, welcome everyone to the Global Media Policy Seminar Series. This is an online seminar series jointly organized between the Program in Comparative Media Law and Policy, that's PCMLP, at the University of Oxford and the School of Communication at the University of Johannesburg. This series features insights on pressing issues affecting new media and human rights, particularly at the margins. We've been hosting live stream talks to help bridge the gap between conversations happening in the global north and the global south on cutting edge media issues. We hope you'll continue to join us for future seminars. Please sign up by visiting the PCMLP website or tune in live on YouTube at PCMLP Oxford, which you should be able to see on your screens now. Um, today we'll be taking questions here on Zoom, so please use the Q&A feature available in your Zoom window. And if you're watching the live stream on YouTube, please tweet your questions to at Oxford Media Law. All right, well, now that we've covered the housekeeping issues, I will stop sharing my screen for a moment. Um, I'm Kira Allman. I'm a postdoctoral research fellow in media law and policy at the Center for Sociolegal Studies at the University of Oxford. And I am delighted to introduce today our guest speaker, Christopher Ali. Christopher Ali is an associate professor in the Department of Media Studies at the University of Virginia. His current research focuses on the rural urban digital divide, a very timely topic, telecommunications and broadband policy and broadband access during COVID-19. He is the author of the forthcoming book, Farm Fresh Broadband, The Future of Rural Connectivity from MIT Press. And uh, he is also the author of multiple high ranking journal articles and book chapters. His work has appeared in the New York Times, The Hill, Columbia Journalism Review and The Conversation. And he is also the author of Media Localism, The Policies of Place. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Chris for his talk. Thank you very much, Kira, and, and thank you very much uh, for this opportunity to, to speak today and talk a little bit about my research. I am I'm deeply honored to be speaking uh, with all of you today and as part of the speaker series. Um, I'm going to go ahead and, and share my screen um, and hopefully everyone can see this. Uh, the, the title of my talk today is When Good is the Enemy of Great Rural Broadband in a Time of COVID-19. And I want to make two arguments today. The first is that the failure to correct the rural urban digital divide here in the United States, particularly considering the COVID-19 pandemic, is not one of technology, but it's one of markets, politics and policy. And I'm going to get into that a little bit more later on. And I also want to talk about the fact that rural broadband policy here in the US, but I suspect um, you know, in a lot of different countries, is defined by what I call the politics of good enough, which tends to serve the interests of major telecommunications providers over those of communities in um, here in rural America. Um, as Kira said, a lot of this is coming out of the, the research I did over the last four years for my forthcoming book, Farm Fresh Broadband, what is now being called the politics of rural connectivity versus the future of rural connectivity. And that's gonna be out um, in fall 2021 with MIT Press. And in that project, I asked two major research questions. The first is where is the $6 billion a year the federal government is spending on rural broadband subsidies going? And the second is with a particular focus on agricultural communities, how is broadband policy lived and experienced in rural America? To answer these questions, um, and probably to uh, answer why there's a picture of me and my hound dog Tuna and the Jolly Green Giant, uh, we go to uh, methods. And this involves an analysis of over 10,000 pages of policy documents from 2009 to 2020, um, over 90 in-depth interviews. And then it involved a 3,600 mile road trip across the United States, um, Tuna, my hound dog being my co-pilot here. Uh, and, and this was all in the need to kind of humanize broadband policy uh, for, for all of us in the law and policy field. It turns out that policy may not have the most human face to it. And in order to do that, I needed to understand how broadband is actually lived in rural America. 
Uh, so this became what I called on Twitter, the hashtag rural broadband road trip in the summer of 2018 and involved, uh, again, a 3,600 mile drive um, uh, across the Midwest of the country. And there I spoke with elected officials and farmers and broadband users, librarians, state representatives, interest groups, people in grocery stores, um, anyone and everyone who would talk to Tuna and I. My work is, is always rooted in the critical political economy of communication. But for this project, I, I kind of branched out a little bit looking at theories of power and legitimacy, what I call, or what Black calls polycentric regulation, policy failure and regulatory capture. A uh, couple of publications are, are coming out of this research, obviously the, the key one being my book, which I'm really excited about. Um, I have an article coming out in precisely five days with the International Journal of Communication called The Politics of Good Enough. And it's really from that article that I'll be drawing a lot from in today's talk. I had an op-ed in the New York Times in February of 2019 um, titled The National Rural Broadband Plan. And earlier, I had a piece in telecommunications policy called The Reluctant Regulator. So let's get into a little bit of the meat and potatoes about broadband here in the United States. The Federal Communications Commission defines broadband by speed. And they say that broadband is an always on connection of 25 megabits per second download and three megabits per second upload. And that's the definition the FCC uh, enacted in 2015 when it raised the definition of broadband from four megabits per second download, one megabit per second upload. According to the Federal Communications Commission, uh, about 94.4% of Americans have access to broadband. Um, and out of that, we have 98.5% of urban Americans, 77.7% of rural Americans, and 72.3% of those on tribal lands. But as I'm going to talk about in the next 51 minutes or so, um, we're going to see how, how these numbers are greatly inflated, upwards of 50%. When we talk about the rural urban digital divide here in the US, we tend to be talking about one of infrastructure rather than one of access. Um, so here what we have is about 16.9 million rural Americans that lack broadband. Only 63% of rural Americans have a home subscription. 15% of rural adults say they actually never go online. 18% of rural students lack broadband access and 24% of rural Americans say that is a major issue. On top of all of this, rural Americans also pay more, have fewer options and worse connections than their urban counterparts. So for instance, only 19% of rural Americans have a choice in broadband provider. And then rural Americans also pay upwards of 37% more for broadband connectivity. And this is already in a country in which broadband subscriptions are um, incredibly inflated. So if the rural urban digital divide is one of infrastructure access, the urban one tends to be defined more uh, in terms of affordability, right? And here we find that 44% of low income Americans earning less than $30,000 a year do not have a home broadband subscription. A full 18% of the population of New York City lacks access to broadband because of cost and other factors. We also have, um, as in many countries, a racialized digital divide. So of course the digital divide uh, in terms of access, in terms of skill, in terms of digital literacy tends to uh, replicate or reflect existing inequalities in society. Ours is no different. Here in the United States, 34% of black adults do not have a home broadband connection. 39% of Latinx adults do not have a home broadband uh, connection. And 47% of those on tribal lands do not have a home broadband connection. Of course, all of this is exacerbated during this time of COVID-19, right? We've seen the massive migration to online platforms for work, study, play, life. Immediately in March of 2020, there were concerns that American networks would not be able to keep up with the added demand and download and upload speeds. And this was particularly true of those who had a satellite connection, a DSL connection, or a cable connection. The UN in 2020 called the broadband access a matter of life and death. Uh, during this time of COVID. Uh, we know from various studies uh, released recently that those without home broadband are less likely to social distance. Um, and we've seen a lack of access for those recently unemployed because of limitations to the FCC's Lifeline program, which is a program that subsidizes 
uh, broadband or mobile connectivity for low income households. We're also seeing tens of thousands of students fall behind. Uh, this is what FCC Commissioner Jessica Rosenmersel has called the new homework gap. And she calls it the cruelest part of the digital divide. We're seeing uh, stories and anecdotes and experiences of, of people having to drive to the parking lots of libraries and McDonald's to use Wi-Fi. We're seeing a national shortage of hotspots because of a distribution problem. And then in all of this, we see a lack of authority by the Federal Communications Commission to really um, uh, confront these challenges. So COVID-19 certainly has not caused the rural urban digital divide or the many digital divides that haunt the United States, but they did exacerbate it. It also made it an issue of life and death, right? If you're, not, if you're less likely to social distance without a broadband connection. Throughout this, we now we've also seen uh, the re-emergence of conversations of broadband as a human right, and recently broadband as a civil right here in the United States. On top of all of this, we can think about why broadband would be essential for a rural community. And this is what I call the five pillars of rural broadband. And these include economic development, these include education, telehealth, civic engagement, and quality of life. And again, all of this becomes exacerbated during this time of COVID-19, um, when we are all forced to live, work, study, shop, communicate, sometimes even vote from home and, and sometimes online. So just a couple of quotes from my interviews across the country. This is one that I absolutely adore. And this is uh, from a, a, a broadband advocate in the state of Minnesota, who just told me that everything is better with better broadband. Right? And, and I find this particularly poignant um, and, and particularly poignant during this time of COVID-19 when broadband becomes our lifeline to the world. Another thing someone said to me is that broadband is the next electricity. And of course, in the 1930s, the United States had a major federal initiative to connect rural America to the electrical grid. It was hugely successful. It involved a massive amount of federal coordination. It, it, it created a new agency called the Rural Electrification Administration, a commitment of $100 million in 1935. Just an incredible effort to connect this country and it worked. Um, so then we, what we should be asking ourselves and what I've been curious about um, in the last in the last few years and, and obviously particularly in this time of COVID is why haven't we solved the rural urban digital divide and why is it also getting worse? Why are we seeing rural communities kind of stuck with a DSL digital subscriber line satellite connectivity while urban and wealthy areas of the country are moving towards 5G and fiber to the home? How can we explain these discrepancies? How can we explain the differences between a political and policy conversation that wants to amend the digital divide and yet on the ground, we're not seeing a lot of movement happen. So this introduces us to two key terms um, in, in rural research. The first is of course, market failure. Critical political economists will be really familiar with this term. Uh, this idea that the market is unable or unwilling to provide for a socially important good because of a lack of return on investment. And this defines uh, uh, broadband inequality in the United States, particularly in rural America. There is not enough people, and these people are too vastly spread out for there to be a return on investment um, from, from private broadband providers, uh, which is how we provide broadband here in the United States and which is why we uh, have billions of dollars worth of subsidy to incentivize these private providers to go in um, and serve these communities. There's also this concept known as the rural penalty, which became incredibly important to my work, which are the material and figurative costs paid by rural residents and businesses for their geographic distance from the centers of commerce and culture. And you might think, well, I mean, telecommunications, this should be solving the rural penalty and it has for some, and you know, it, it, it certainly makes um, life more instantaneous, but not everyone has the luxury of connectivity in rural America. So why don't they? How do we explain this discrepancy between policy and practice, right? And, and here's what I identify in my work as the failures of rural broadband policy 
and I identified four such failures. These include management, meaning, mapping, and money. And I want to walk us through um, these. And in doing so, I'm hoping to be able to tell this story of rural broadband policy here in the United States over the last decade. First, though, just to revisit this idea of what I call the politics of good enough. Right, so what I argue is that rural broadband policy here in the US is defined by the idea of good enough that encourages fast deployment, but of outdated technologies, and it benefits the largest telecommunications and satellite companies. So, you know, uh, to, to, you know, in short or in sum, the politics of good enough mean that just whatever we can get out the door, whatever we can get to rural America, it's good enough. So long as it's something, it's good enough, right? Um, and But what we're seeing is that with the deployment of fiber optics and the launch of 5G, we have a real-time case study of the politics of good enough, because so much of rural America is stuck in the dial-up age, as Levitz and Bauerlein call it, um, stuck in the dial-up age. And it's, it's important to remember 60,000 American farms still have dial-up, and about 2 million people still use dial-up, right? And that, that's... That's amazing. That's a, that's a huge amount of individuals, a huge amount of businesses. So this is when I say that good or good enough is the enemy of great, that we cannot uh, re, uh, reside ourselves to a politics of good enough. We need to make sure that what is getting out the door, what is being deployed in rural America is great broadband. And uh, at the end of this talk, I'm gonna tell you why that's so important. So let's look at these four failures of rural broadband policy here in the United States, starting with this first one of management. Broadband, rural broadband is, is what Black calls a polycentric regulatory environment. You have, you have a bunch of competing regulators here in the United States. The, the key one is, of course, the Federal Communications Commission, uh, but we also have the United States Department of Agriculture and the National Telecommunications and Information Administration, all of which who are kind of vying for a little bit of control over setting and implementing broadband policy here in the United States. And it leads to a bit of this problem of, of, of too many chefs or too many cooks in the kitchen. Right, um, and, and we have we end up having some legitimacy issues uh, with broadband policy. I'm just going to give you an example here. In 2008, Congress ordered the Federal Communications Commission and USDA, the United States Department of Agriculture, to craft a national rural broadband strategy. Now, unfortunately, it kind of received only minimal public comments, but um, one of the major themes was interagency cooperation. A lot of these broadband groups, advocacy organizations, and companies and providers wanted to see greater coordination between the Federal Communications Commission and USDA. Uh, the report um, was, uh, was released in 2009, and it ended up being authored entirely by the Federal Communications Commission, with seemingly very little input um, from USDA. So, so much for uh, interagency cooperation back in 2009. And then unfortunately, the entire plan was eventually eclipsed and scrapped uh, when the country launched the national broadband plan the following year. Uh, if, if any of you have ever been to DC and know kind of the geography of where these agencies are located, you might know that the FCC and USDA are located roughly one or two blocks apart from each other. But in terms of their approach to broadband policy, they couldn't be further away. And this is a quote from Jonathan Adelstein, who is a former uh, commissioner with the FCC and former director of the Rural Utility Service of USDA. And he tells me that, I think that the FCC doesn't always understand its relationship to RUS. It considers itself the big dog and it's going to do what it's going to do and it doesn't want to be trapped. So this just kind of demonstrates this is failure of management, this failure of interagency cooperation um, uh, to get rural broadband deployed um, in a timely and equitable fashion as the Telecommunications Act orders the FCC to do. So that was failure one. Failure one is a problem of management. Failure two, in my, in my view, in my research, is a failure of meaning. So first of all, we've got a problem with this definition of 25.3. Couple of problems here. First of all, it was set in 2015. And um, so it's outdated. And it's outdated because it does not encompass Americans' current broadband needs or usage. So for instance, the average download speed here in the United States is 135 megabits per second. The average upload speed is 52 megabits per second. The average daily usage is 12 uh, gigabits. 
um, upwards and then up to 15 gigabit, gigabytes, excuse me, in times of COVID. It's also as asynchronous or asymmetric, excuse me. Uh, so here it privileges download over upload. And if download is about consumption, consumption, right? It's about streaming Netflix. Upload is about production. It's about business transactions. It's about this Zoom conversation. It's about homework. So we have a definition in the United States that is outdated, that uh, does not encompass Americans' current needs and um, is asymmetric. The other issue um, is that the United States, as most countries have, has adopted a policy of technological neutrality, right? Policies cannot discriminate against or in favor of specific technology. And this is the idea that we should not have technologies that say, well, we need to deploy fiber to everybody or, or low earth orbital satellite delivery to everybody, that, that policy should be technologically neutral. The issue though, is that when we take technological neutrality and we couple it with a slow and outdated uh, speed threshold, let's say 25.3, we get a, a policy of technological neutrality that favors inadequate technologies provided by incumbent telecommunications and satellite companies, right? So a lot of these companies, because DSL, because satellite can, can meet this 25.3 threshold, there's no incentive for them to upgrade their networks or, or upgrade their wires to, for instance, fiber. So this, this technological neutrality um, coupled with 25.3 has meant that we have a failure of meaning in rural broadband policy. So this is something I often like to say when I go when I go across the country is that not all broadband access technologies are equal, right? And we're certainly seeing this in a time of COVID that DSL and satellite connections cannot measure up. We're seeing a lot of delays and some network congestion um, when, when everyone is trying to zoom at the same time um, or uh, work and shop and play and study from home. And so not all broadband access technologies are equal, but currently, policy set by the Federal Communications Commission suggests that they are equal, right? So that there's no difference in policy between fiber and satellite. So if our first failure was that of management, the second failure that of meaning, the third failure of rural broadband policy is that of mapping. So remember when I said that the FCC said or reported that 77.7% .7 of rural Americans have access to broadband. Well, multiple studies have demonstrated that that number is off by at least 50%. Um, US Telecom found 38% uh, that it's off by 38%. Microsoft announced that 162.8 million Americans or half the population lack access to, broad, to the internet at broadband speeds, All right? So the FCC's numbers are grossly inflated, which again leads to a failure of policy. Why are they grossly inflated? It's all about how the FCC collects data. So broadband providers have to report their networks and their connectivity uh, to the FCC twice a year using something called Form 477, uh, which has become quite infamous here in the US on broadband policy circles. Uh, this form, it's obviously broadband data is self-reported by industry. Most egregiously though, it is collected at the census block level. Census blocks are, uh, can be as small as, as, a, as a neighborhood or a couple of streets. It can be as large as 8,000 square miles. Um, it's, it's the uh, kind of common denominator uh, for how we run the census. The problem though, is that when we've measured uh, broadband deployment by the census block, so long as one building within that census block has broadband, the provider can report that the entire census block is served. So, so long as just one building has broadband, everyone is considered to have broadband, which obviously is not the case, right? Um, so that's a major failure. ISPs also report advertised speeds and not actual speeds. So there's a big difference, for instance, in a DSL network where you're, you might be right beside the network node and no one might be on the network and it's a brand new copper wire. And sure, you might be able to get some blazing fast speeds, um, but that may not be the kind of lived reality of most Americans. It also includes satellite broadband or satellite internet um, in, this, in this mix here. Uh, satellite has been known to uh, struggle to reach the 25.3 threshold, even on the best of days, even on the, the clearest of days without any wind or without any cloud or without any pine trees. Um, 
Uh, so it's struggled consistently, and yet the FCC considers to think about it as a reliable broadband technology. So what all of this has meant is that we have grossly inflated the number of Americans, particularly the number of rural Americans who have a broadband connection. I wanna give you one example from my uh, neck of the woods here in the state of Virginia. Um, this is where I am here, city of Charlottesville. Uh, the county right beside us is called Louisa County. According to the Federal Communications Commission, Louisa County is 100% served with broadband. If we though take out satellite out of this equation, we find that only 40% of the county has broadband at 25.3, again, according to the Federal Communications Commission. If we look at actual speed tests run by consumers in Louisa County, for, however, we see that only that the average download speed is 3.91 megabits per second. The average upload speed is 1.69. So these don't even meet the definitions of broadband in 2010, let alone the definitions of broadband in 2015 and today. So what are the implications here of this? Because the FCC says that Louisa County is 100% served with broadband, um, despite what these numbers tell us, it means that Louisa is ineligible for federal grants, loans, and subsidies. Right? And so this is dramatic. It means that people in Louisa County are stuck either being unconnected or underconnected, um, and they are disqualified or ineligible from applying uh, for funding from the Federal Communications Commission. So that's pretty detrimental. Right? So it's a colossal failure of mapping. The fourth failure of rural broadband policy is that of money. And this is where uh, we can really follow where the $6 billion a year uh, we use to subsidize or the government uses to subsidize rural broadband deployment is going. So there are two major sources of, of funding for broadband deployment in rural America here in the United States. The first is from the Federal Communications Commission, which allocates $5 billion a year in subsidies for operational expenditures to broadband providers. The second is from USDA, which offers 1.4 billion annually in loans and grants for capital expenditures to broadband providers. And both of these programs tend to favor incumbent providers, um, particularly the largest telecommunications companies over upstarts, over municipalities and communities, over cooperatives. If we drill down and look at some of the specific programs, we notice on a number of issues um, that, that complicate or that stymie rural broadband deployment. The first is it's a program called the Connect America Fund, and this went from 2015 to 2020. And it saw $1.2 billion a year given to the nine largest telecommunications companies in exchange for minimal build-out requirements. So they only had to meet a threshold of 10, 1, 10 megabits per second down, 1 megabit per second up, despite the national uh, definition of 25.3. Uh, as a result, many of them, most of them deployed DSL rather than fiber. And lastly, there were no consequences or, no, or um, no accountability for defaults. So two of these companies, uh, CenturyLink and Frontier, uh, did not live up to their build-out uh, commitments in 2018 and 2019, and yet they were not punished. And yet, um, in fact, they're still eligible for more money from the Federal Communications Commission. Uh, we also held a reverse auction for some leftover funds. Uh, this doled out $148 million a year, uh, shared between 103 companies. Uh, this did a little bit better in terms of eligibility. It wasn't just the nine largest telecommunications companies. It included cooperatives and satellites and new entrants. So on the surface, it looks pretty good, although $148 million a year is, is not a colossal amount of money. Uh, but again, it stuck to this connection between 25.3 and technological neutrality that allowed Viasat, a satellite provider, which only committed to providing baseline or basic speeds of 25.3 to become one of the largest winners um, in what's called the CAF reverse auction. So again, we're still kind of holding on to this old logic of, of, of favoring incumbent providers. Uh, now we've got the Rural Digital Opportunity Fund, which is just getting off the ground. Um, uh, the, the first call or the first announcement was in 2018. We should be seeing um, money kind of come out the door in 2021. Uh, this is a $20.4 billion program uh, that's going to be released over 10 years. Uh, but a couple of problems here. It's still relying on those bad maps. So our dear friends in Louisa County are still going to be ineligible for this money. Uh, SpaceX and Starlink, their low Earth orbital satellite program, um, is permitted to compete for funding. 
Um, that said, uh, it's kind of an unproven technology. And there's concern, or at least I see concern here, that it will replicate the previous failures of rural broadband policy, particularly around eligibility. So here's something pretty exciting. Um, what can we say for a broadband agenda for a new administration that's coming out here in the United States in January? Um, it's quite a delight to be able to, to write this. Well, first of all, we can see that communities are, are connecting themselves despite or in the absence of, of, or despite of policy and market failures. We're seeing telephone and electric cooperatives become the unsung heroes of rural broadband. And we're seeing the importance of public-private partnerships. So we've started to recognize, or some areas have started to recognize that broadband is not exclusively in the purview of the commercial market, nor should it be if it's gonna be a, a human right and a civil right. We're also seeing what I call and, and what, what, what Sylvain calls broadband localism as its finest during this time of COVID. We're seeing Wi-Fi enabled school buses parked in underconnected neighborhoods. We're seeing libraries expanding Wi-Fi into parking lots. We're seeing schools ask the Federal Communications Commission for permission uh, to expand their Wi-Fi networks and kind of become public access hotspots. Uh, we're seeing some counties, in fact, this is in Louisa County, uh, uh, develop solar powered hotspots for, for public Wi-Fi use, which is pretty cool. And we're seeing more and more hotspot loan programs, especially out of libraries um, in rural and urban America. So some amazing examples of broadband localism in the absence of a coherent federal policy to connect this country. So what would I tell um, this new administration? Um, uh, first of all, we do need to raise the definition of broadband. We need to raise it to 100, 100, 100 megabits per second download, 100 megabits per second upload, make it symmetric. Uh, we need to create an office of rural broadband, preferably at the United States Department of Agriculture, to craft and implement rural broadband policy. We need to mandate coordination between these three agencies, the FCC, the USDA, and NTIA. We need to improve the maps and data collection methodology. We need to punish companies that fail to deliver when we've given them money. We need to end favoritism of incumbent providers, augment the Lifeline program, which again is the, the program to help low-income individuals um, uh, have access to broadband and mobile telephony, make that $50 a month, and we need to broaden eligibility criteria. And we need to bring back net neutrality, which will give the FCC a lot more authority in dealing with the truancies um, that, that exist in broadband provision. So I wanna end kind of on, a, on an exciting note. I'm, I'm really eager to take a lot of your questions and, and, and keep this conversation going. But you know, one of the amazing things that I found in my research is that in the 1930s, 40s and 50s, this country connected itself um, with electricity and with telephony. Um, it was a cohort coordinated federal policy effort, but that ended up being led by uh, local communities and electric and telephone cooperatives. So there is precedent for us to do this here in the United States again, to connect the un and underconnected in rural America, in tribal areas, in low income communities. Um, so there, there is precedent here, we've done it before and we can do it again. Um, and I'm hoping that our new administration, uh, this will be one of their major priorities when they start up in January, 2021. Uh, so with that, uh, I want to thank you all for your attention. I want to thank you again um, uh, to, for having me here today. And I really look forward to taking all of your questions and keeping this conversation going. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Chris. That was such an interesting talk and really timely. Um, I have a million questions myself. So um, I, I will start with my, uh, at least probably one or two of my questions. But um, while I, I'm asking you those, I'll encourage anyone who's tuning in right now on Zoom to please send in any questions you might have using the Q&A um, feature in Zoom. And uh, I'll also kind of be watching Twitter here. So if you're tuning in on the live stream, feel free to tweet at Oxford Media Law. And uh, I will hopefully catch any questions that come in on there as well. Very much multitasking right now. But um, I was wondering, uh, Chris, if you could talk a little bit about any recent policies uh, that have come into play. You mentioned uh, a couple toward the end of your talk that have been a bit more successful at targeting some of the more marginalized communities in 
in these rural settings. So one that comes to mind uh, recently, and I'm kind of wondering whether you think this is an effective strategy or not, is the um, uh, tribal priority window that the FCC opened, uh, which allowed uh, basically indigenous communities in the US to um, access, uh, I believe it was the 2.5 gigahertz spectrum um, uh, in, in their areas. And I'm wondering, uh, yeah, if there are other policies like that, uh, that you're aware of that are, are useful in different uh, various different ways. And also what you think of that policy as, uh, as kind of an innovation to try to really help reach some of these communities in need of access. That's a, that's a great question, Kira. Thank you. Um, I'm a big fan of the, of the tribal window, the, the 2.5 uh, gigahertz auction window. Um, we need to spend more time thinking about strategies to connect tribal areas here in the United States. I think this is one of the kind of colossal failures of, of even in our scholarly communities. So we can think about uh, er, the urban digital divide, the rural digital divide, and yet the, the tribal digital divide um, is, is much more egregious than either of these. So I think the, the, the 2.5 um, gigahertz auction uh, will hopefully go a long way to incentivize providers, but more importantly for me, um, to encourage kind of local providers uh, to, uh, to, get in, to, to get into this, or maybe uh, encourage those who had maybe not thought about um, being a provider or being a retail provider uh, to be able to step up and uh, certainly, it's a great opportunity for fixed wireless deployment here in the United States. Uh, two others that I'll flag is we recently had the the six gigahertz um, uh, auction and movement towards that. Uh, the you know that was originally going to be or was promoted to be for Wi-Fi six, but we've seen a lot of fixed wireless providers take advantage of that spectrum. Um, and fixed wireless has been amazing for rural areas of the United States, particularly agricultural communities where it's just not feasible. Um, to connect, you know, uh, 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 dozens of square mile farm um, to, with, with wires. Um, but fixed wireless has been pretty amazing um, so long as it's uh, fueled with kind of a fiber, fiber optic backhaul. Um, so that I think has also been a, a, been a boon to, to rural broadband. Um, there's also been a little bit of movement uh, that, that I like to see um, on the E-rate program. E-rate is the uh, the subsidy program for schools and libraries. Um, it generally was um, really tightly drawn, but in COVID, what we saw is a number of, of schools ask the FCC for permission to become kind of neighborhood hotspots and also to use funding to loan out hotspots to to their to their students. Um, the FCC said yes on a temporary basis. I'm really hoping they'll make that permanent because I would love to see federally funded schools as in that we subsidize their broadband um, to become neighborhood anchor institutions. I think that would be you know, uh, really amazing and seeing schools want to become those anchor institutions. But right now, the way that their funding is drawn for broadband, they're not, that would be a violation. Um, so hopefully that temporary waiver will become a permanent waiver. Um, we've also seen an attempt at, by Congress to move into this space. Um, uh, uh, Congressperson Jim Clyburn out of South Carolina introduced the Accessible and Affordable Internet for All Act back in June. That would have allocated $100 billion for broadband deployment, um, 80 billion specifically for deployment, 20 billion for access, digital literacy, skill development. That would have solved this issue of the digital divide. Um, unfortunately, it didn't, uh, it didn't go very far, but there's impetus here. Like we're seeing movement. Uh, which for me is really exciting. Um, you know, I wish we had a more cooperative Senate that would actually see these things go through. Uh, but um, we are starting to see, and COVID has certainly energized this conversation um, at Congress. Uh, but the other problem, though, is that uh, without net neutrality, um, uh, the FCC really has very little authority to tell ISPs what to do anymore. Um, so one of our first priorities moving into a new administration needs to be to reenact net neutrality, hopefully um, at, at the, the congressional level uh, to, to empower the FCC to kind of become that, that a watchdog and, and that champion for broadband deployment that we want it to be. 
Wonderful. Thank you so much, Chris, for answering that question. Um, some really uh, important examples there. We've had a couple of questions come in. Um, I apologize in advance to anybody whose name I horribly mispronounce. I hope I won't. But um, the first question that we've got is from Signe, uh, who says, thanks a lot for your very interesting talk. Can you elaborate a bit more on why you think the broadband definition should be symmetrical, 100-100, and uh, why isn't it currently? Uh, that's a great question. Um, thank you so much, uh, Sumi, uh, for this. Um, okay, a couple of reasons why I think it needs to be symmetric. One, it will reflect uh, how we're currently using broadband, right? Um, you know, our, our national average is already kind of approaching that. But what, what symmetric broadband does, it, it allows for faster upload speeds, right? Um, which is something I think we really need. Uh, what I'm noticing um, particularly on Zoom conversations, right, is that the upload speeds are so weak that that's where we're getting a lot of a lot of latency, a lot of interference, um, a lot of buffering, uh, and 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 so I think that there's that. I it's it's going to help business. It's going to help us when we need to upload terabytes worth of data uh, from farms, for instance. Um, I've spent a lot of time thinking about writing about talking to farmers and precision agriculture, this kind of new generation of of agriculture technologies, but they're uploading terabytes worth of data um, and, and a symmetric definition uh, would really encourage the deployment of next generation technologies for these communities. Um, why hasn't it been done? Um, here's my, here's my the, I guess the young people would call it a hot take. Here's my hot take on why this hasn't happened. Um, a lot of it, the definition is set to privilege the cable industry, right? Coaxial cable, even, even hybrid, um, offers blazing fast download speed and pretty standard subpar upload speeds, right? But that's the that's what cable technology can do. That's what a coaxial cable can do. And that's why we've seen here in the United States so much kind of advertisement about upload speeds, upload speeds, upload speeds, um, because cable providers are the dominant way that Americans get the internet. Um, and so to me, it's kind of been where you see kind of industry hype over download speeds meet up with federal policy, uh, which now reflects the hype. Um, think about it. If, if we forced a national average of 100, 100 or symmetrical speed, it would really force a lot of innovation on the deployment side, because suddenly a lot of these technologies, which are kind of on the verge of, of uh, distress um, or on the verge of not being able to provide us with the connectivity that we need specifically when we're working from home and studying from home. Um, I, I, I think it would incentivize it without favoring one technology over another. So that's my, uh, and we, sorry, I'll just say one more thing. We have also seen some states do this, um, that they will fund anything that can get to 100, 100, or at least 120. Um, but you know they won't find anything beneath that that can't offer that on day one. So there's a little bit of precedent here. I'll actually uh, hop in with kind of a follow-on question of my own there, because um, I'm wondering in your interviews with people in rural communities, whether you came across any specific push factors that were kind of um, causing people to really need more than ever to go online beyond kind of the ones that uh, that come to mind and that you did cover in your talk, things like the, the increased uh, use of uh, online educational tools and things like that. I'll give one small example, because as you know, I, I also am interested in rural broadcasting Broadband, but in the UK and in, in the context here, uh, what we've seen is that over time, because more and more government services have gone online, uh, rural communities are having to interact with those government platforms. Um, on digital in a digital way. So for instance, DEFRA, um, which is where you would register, for instance, the birth of cattle and sheep and things like that, uh, that whole process, which used to be a paper process is now online. So farmers all need to be uploading that kind of information online. When you mentioned the need to upload content, it made me wonder if there are any push factors like that uh, in the US context. Yeah, I, I absolutely there are. And again, um, I, would, I would point to, to precision agriculture. Uh, where what we're seeing is the need for machine to machine communication. So for instance, that, um, that your harvester uh, is immediately synced uh, to, to another piece of equipment, um, which requires you know, symmetric upload and download or sharing. But the one I wanna talk about in particular was I visited an agricultural drone company in a town called Winnebago, which is a small town in, in Minnesota, the state of Minnesota. 
and um, they produce high resolution imagery um, from their drones, obviously, but they also have developed technology that have um, sensors that you can place sensors in the ground that have um, a modem attached to them so they can constantly upload real time soil analysis, which can be hugely beneficial. I mean, think about it. Uh, farmers, not just in the United States, but around the world need to up their production by 50% in the next 50 years in order to feed this country, this, this, this world of ours that is just growing. Um, which means we need to be, we need to think about sustainability. We need to think about how to maximize yields. Um, so this technology can be incredibly important, um, but it requires that kind of symmetric or at least at the very least fast, fast, fast upload speeds because we need to have this real time data um, in order to kind of make the necessary adjustments or they need to have this real time data. So this is where I'm really seeing um, that. But I'm also, the last thing I'll add is, um, you know, when we think about businesses relocating to rural communities, one of the first things they look for is not just a broadband connection, but usually a fiber optic connection. Fiber optic, of course, offers symmetric upload download, usually about at the gig level. Um, so I've, I've heard of communities losing out on businesses, on business relocation. And on the flip side, I've heard of, of communities gaining businesses because they could offer that symmetric one gig, one gig. Um, uh, uh, I'm thinking particular of a of a shrimp farm in the Midwest that chose one community um, because they could offer a fiber optic connection. So, you know, rural America for the very first time since the census began has seen a net decline in population. And I think that, you know, broadband, this is not a build it and they will come situation, but without broadband, we're certainly seeing um, the, def the deficits and, and that symmetric definition is going to be that much more important too recruit and retain talent and young people and, and colleges in rural America. Okay, yeah, really interesting um, point. Uh, our next question comes from Jose, who uh, is wondering if you could tell us a bit more about uh, the research project that, you, that you've done concluding that not having access to broadband was correlated with quarantine behavior in some way. Well, this is a great uh, question, Jose, and also extra credit because Jose is um, one of my graduate students. Um, uh, so it's not a it's not a study I did. Uh, first of all, I should say that it's a study that I cite. Um, and what what this study uh, found um, is that uh, those who have the wealthier you are and the more connected you are um, leads to the greater propensity for social distancing. Right. So um, you know we look at that on the inverse. The less wealthy you are, the less connected you are, um, may mean that you are less likely to social distance. Um, my gut reaction, um, this was a quantitative study, not qualitative, right? So we don't have this kind of lived experience of social distancing, but just think about it. I mean, imagine being in a situation in which you're at home without the internet, maybe without a mobile device. How are you going to live your life? Um, I've recently completed research in a broadband desert community. Uh, with my colleague Nicholas Matthews, um, and and we see a lot more the forcing of a lot more people to move around, right? To drive around, to go to that parking lot, to go to the library. There's just a lot more movement. There's a lot more what what Matthews and I call labor. There's a lot more work involved, which means you have to leave the house to even just go about your daily life. You can't order groceries, um, even little things like that that so many of us take for granted. Um, and again, I'm just kind of flushing out this study, but uh, like to me, it seems like it's a very understandable conclusion um, that without the internet, without high-speed internet access, you're probably not going to stay at home, or it's going to be harder to stay at home. Um, and in this country, where we're seeing hundred a hundred thousand cases a day, we need people to stay at home <laughs> as much as possible, but they need the internet to do so. Yeah, definitely. Um, it's it, I think it's a really important consideration right now how much um, the the internet and use of the internet is linked to health outcomes, um, and that happen. I think that's um, on a number of levels. Uh, obviously, uh, the ones that that study detail are um, are among the most important. 
Um, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more, um, Chris, about uh, the, the interviews that you did and the kinds of people that you spoke to. Um, I, I, I would imagine that there's a whole range of people with different backgrounds and experiences. Um, so if you could just talk a little bit more about the internet, uh, sorry, the internet, the interview experience in general. And then a more specific question I have for you is in communities where the communities themselves are mobilizing to get internet into their communities in some way, whether that's uh, they form a cooperative or they piggyback on an existing cooperative to do that, or whether they really kind of take matters into their own hands and lobby government to take action. Um, in those communities, are, is there a certain type of person that that leads that kind of mobilization? Um, and uh, what are what are the qualities of those people that tend to be the biggest advocates for internet in their communities? Two, two really great questions. First of all, I love any questions about method. Um, so uh, happy to elaborate on that. Um, I started off this project doing what most critical policy scholars do, which was a plan for policy analysis and elite expert interviews. So my plan was kind of like my first project, I'm going to interview policymakers and elected officials, we're going to talk about broadband. It, it, it became abundantly clear to me <laughs> that there is so much more um, to, to, to broadband and to understand broadband policy than just talking to, to those who craft the policy. You need to talk about, you need to talk to people who live the policy. And so I actually um, borrowed from uh, a theology and a religion. They have a, they have a theory called lived theology, which is, it's not enough to understand the gospel. You have to understand how the gospel is lived. I took that, replaced gospel with policy. I developed a, a kind of a method of lived policy where I realized I needed to get out and, 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 and speak with people. And so I, I did not necessarily, I did not set out to have a particular demographic in mind where, you know, or, or even to make this representative, what I just wanted was to get on the road to talk to people. Um, so I started off simply by asking the interviews that I'd already done, do you know anybody who would be interested in like me dropping by in Kentucky and in Illinois and in Indiana and in Minnesota? Um, and it just kind of snowballed from there. And I honestly would talk to anyone and everyone um, who would speak to me about this issue. Uh, there's, I have this great story uh, that I write about in a paper I just uh, wrote where I was in line at a grocery store in Missouri chatting to the people behind me. And they were saying that their friend had just bought a farm but was from the city, but was super surprised he didn't have broadband and is super frustrated and doesn't know what to do. I mean, this is great. So um, one of the things I'm always encouraging and I try to actually live what I preach these days is for policy scholars to incorporate more ethnographic methods into our work to actually, you know, and I, I don't claim to be an ethnographer I, um, that, you know, that is a skill set beyond me, um, but at least to incorporate kind of lived interviews um, and field visits and site visits, not just at AT&T or in Washington, DC, but, you know, in the middle of Minnesota. Um, this one community in Minnesota, Rock County, ended up being a whole case study for me in my book. And I devoted an entire chapter to it uh, because her story was so compelling. Um, which brings me to the, the, the second, um, the second uh, question you ask here, which is about communities, what kind of person does it take to be uh, that kind of digital champion? Um, uh, certainly that, that person, I think it's, it's a person who is deeply frustrated. <laughs> um, and it's a person who does understand the value of broadband because, because we're still at a point where maybe not everyone does, or there is kind of this, this pervasiveness of this good enough. Well, I, you know, I've got dial up, it's good enough for my needs. Um, so it, it's someone who takes that, that kind of forward thinking look. Uh, it's, it also needs to be someone who has an incredible um, uh, amount of energy because this is, an uphill battle here in the United States. And just as an example, 19 states either prohibit or inhibit communities from connecting themselves. Um, so if you're in Texas, for instance, and you wanna bring broadband to your community, if you don't have a private provider, it's not gonna happen it's against Texas law to do that. Um, if you're lucky enough to find yourself in a state that is a much more favorable, so for instance, the state of Minnesota, it does get a little bit easier. Um, but the, this person has to be incredibly resourceful and. Though the key thing I notice amongst these digital champions is just an incredible amount of energy and a deep commitment to their community. Um, but they come from all walks of life. One person was a county administrator. Another one was a farmer who then got elected to a port authority. Um, another one is just a young person who recognizes the importance of it. So, but what they have in common is, again, I just think about, they, they must never sleep because this is a 24 seven job. 
to bring broadband to places that the private market has not just abandoned, but ignores entirely. Um, and this is one of the one of the tensions here in the United States and, and, and around the world is this tension between internet as a right and us having surrendered it to the private market. Um, and I, I see this kind of being played out in real time here in the United States. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a really, really important point um, that you just made. Uh, to kind of return to um, the conversation that we were having a moment ago about um, the push factors that make people want to go online um, or need to go online. Um, it, sometimes it's a want, sometimes it's a need. And um, I'm, I'm kind of wondering if on the policy side of things, we also need to be considering uh, some the effect of some of those push factors on the part of governments, for instance, really digitizing a lot of services and um, kind of requiring more and more of our everyday activities to take place online. Now, obviously, we are in a completely new circumstance uh, living through this global pandemic, where in many cases, we, we don't have very much of a choice. Uh, a, a lot of life has gone online. But um, how, how much of broadband policy in terms of creating more equitable space uh, for people to engage online uh, needs to also be about not uh, maybe not digitizing quite so much? I, I'd love to see that. I, you know, I think here in the United States, um, we've got two divorced conversations. We've got a conversation about the importance of broadband and we've got the push towards digitization. And these two conversations do not talk to each other. Um, they're, cer they're certainly lived, they're lived in these, in these broadband deserts. Policymakers, I don't think are connecting the dots. They're not looking at the increasing digitization of services alongside the lack of broadband deployment here in the United States. Part of this is because of this, this inflated number from the Federal Communications Commission, right? So when you look at a number and you think, well, 94% of the American population has access to broadband, you think, all right, we can go ahead and digitize, right? Um, when that number is closer to 50 or 60%, you start to realize maybe we shouldn't be doing this, or maybe there are very serious inequality issues um, around who has broadband and who doesn't. We, we, we are still, I mean, as much as I, you know, we talk about broadband as a utility or as, as a necessity, I still find the way that we treat broadband here in the US is as a luxury. It's if you can afford it and if the private provider decides that your community is worth the return on investment. I mean, um, so until we can get out of that mindset, we're gonna have these divorced conversations kind of go everywhere. And this is kind of my concern when I, when I talk about the digital divide that's actually growing is that so many of these conversations are not intersecting. Um, uh, and, and so we're going to see, I think, growing um, inequality between particular, I think, a growing underconnected community and a connected community. Um, I do think we've made some progress with the unconnected, although certainly, as you know, noted, Kira, I mean, the tribal communities need an incredible amount of attention um, and resource investment. Uh, but we're seeing so many underconnected communities like in Louisa County that is now ineligible for money because of these bad maps, which are swaying the conversation. I think that's such an interesting point about the metrics and the maps and how, yeah, how this is influencing other aspects of digital mm -hmm. policy, mm -hmm. which are, they are all connected. And those of us who study these issues see them as a whole ecosystem of related problems associated with access and inequality. But they, as you say, they are treated often as separate. Absolutely, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, and um, so I, I'm sorry. sorry. Um, I was gonna say, you know, one, one thing that I've, I've been writing about particularly within higher education is what I call the presumption of the connected. Um, that, you know, you might have some, some, some politicians, policymakers who understand the digital divide, but, you know, the way that I think we initially dealt with the transition to online learning was just an assumption that everybody was connected, right? And that kind of reinforces, well, we can just digitize it. We, everyone can have a Zoom conversation. Um, and if you can't, it's your problem, right? Rather than actually recognize that the digital divide sits on top of all of these other inequalities um, that haven't been solved yet. Um, so yeah, this presumption of the connected, I think is particularly troublesome during the time of COVID. Yeah, I really like that concept, the presumption of the connected. I'll cite you. Okay. <laughs> um, that sounds great. So we really only have time for about one more question. So I'll just close uh, with this one, which is about the method of connectivity. You did mention this um, a little uh, a little while ago um, uh, in terms of what 
what's probably the best method of connecting rural communities and what do people prefer? You did mention the kind of preference in some areas for full fiber connection, which is no surprise. Um, a lot of people describe full fiber optic connection, which is usually fiber to the home or fiber to the premises as kind of a future proof solution mm -hmm. because you're, you're getting that fiber optic cable direct to the building or the premise that you're talking about. Um, but a lot of these uh, new FCC policies that are getting rolled out are kind of exploring a whole array of different options um, for getting folks connected. You mentioned SpaceX and some of these satellite companies. And there's a lot of criticism, I think, floating around uh, uh, of satellite and, for instance, 5G solutions for connecting rural communities. And I'm kind of wondering, based on your extensive research on rural connectivity, um, what you would recommend the government prioritize in terms of the actual hardware? What, what is the actual technology that rural communities need need to be properly connected for the future? Right, that's a great question. Um, I think w one thing that if we look at the wireless options, if we look at 5G, doesn't matter what band you're on. And if we look at fixed wireless, the thing that these two have in common is the need for a fiber middle mile and backhaul, right? So we can't be talking about 5G. We can't be talking about fixed wireless without a fiber backhaul. We need to invest in fiber. I, um, Maybe I'm, I'm slightly less bullish about whether or not fiber needs to always be the last mile. Susan Crawford for, certainly um, has endorsed that and, and her magnificent book lays out a great argument for why it'd be amazing if this country had 100% fiber to the home. Um, but uh, for any of these other technologies to work, we need that fiber optic uh, backbone network. And, and so that is certainly something we need to be investing in. Um, I am highly skeptical of the hype around 5G for rural broadband. Um, certainly, you know, it needs low band, um, you know, a high band or millimeter wave is not feasible for rural America, for rural anywhere really, because we need for small cells. Um, if it's going to be low band, I mean, really what you're then offering is a kind of a 4G LTE experience. Is that powerful enough to replace a fixed or a, 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 a fixed wired uh, broadband to the home? I'm not sure, I think T-Mobile um, disagrees with me here. But I, I have a lot of skepticism. I think a lot of this, I don't, I don't um, negate the, the potential of 5G, particularly at that millimeter wave level. I'm, I'm skeptical of 5G at the low band level, which is what's going to be deployed in rural America. I'm also very skeptical of, of um, LEOs, low earth orbital satellites. Um, I know SpaceX just had a trial and said they could get up to um, 100 megabits per second, that's way lower than the gig they were promising a few years ago. These are untested technologies. And, and, and um, I think until they can demonstrate um, that, uh, that they're applicable to the entire country and not just downtown Manhattan, I think we should be wary about them. I think, you know, the FCC's focus on the 2.5 gigahertz auction, the travel window, the, the 6 gigahertz, the 5.9, um, we're really seeing that big push for fixed wireless. Uh, I think that's what it's indicating is a push for fixed wireless, which a lot of rural communities have seen as a good stopgap between um, uh, getting maybe a full fiber to the home premises. Certainly fixed wireless will be the future of precision agriculture. And, but you also have these communities where again, like my friends in Rock County, Minnesota, who did, wanted nothing but a fiber to the home network. They now have 99.93% .93 fiber to the home in a rural county of 10,000 people. It's incredible. Uh, but one of the things that I'm seeing when I, when I go to different counties is there is also a need to kind of have a conversation about what all of these technologies do and what are the pros and cons. Um, because one of the things I'm really worried about is communities saying, we'll just wait until 5G. We'll just wait for Starlink. Um, so we won't do any mobilization because according to the commercials, it's just around the corner. It is 100% not just around the corner. We're talking years away. So we need to empower counties, communities, municipalities now to think about their broadband plans, to think about the technologies at hand, um, rather than, you know, kind of having this like waiting for Godot moment where they're just waiting for Elon Musk to connect them. Um, that I think is that that's quite worrisome to me. And, and so I've published work on what I call, you know, all the, uh, everything you wanted to know about broadband, what was afraid to ask, where I unpack each and every technology um, kind of in, in lay terms for communities um, in, in hope that we can 
get everyone to kind of a baseline knowledge and then empower these rural communities to, to make the connections that are right for them, uh, rather than again, this kind of waiting for Musk situation. Yeah, I mean, I couldn't agree more with that assessment. I think, um, yeah, you stated that really well and, and succinctly. Um, yeah, wait, waiting for, for unknown future technologies, untested future technologies, it does not seem like a viable solution for rural communities. Um, so it's interesting right. to hear that's been your experience as well in the mm -hmm. US context, mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. But if like, those commercials are convincing, right? Mm -hmm. um, that 5G and these holograms are just around the corner. So why why would you think you needed to deploy anything else and spend the millions of dollars when you'll just get connected? But it's not gonna happen. Yeah. Yeah, and obviously, and in, in, especially in the current times that we're living through, we need connectivity in these places now, and and the technology exists to to take it there. Absolutely, and that's what I you know why I wanted to open this talk today with the idea that it's not a technological failure. The technologies exist, whether it's fiber, whether it's fixed wireless, it's already there. This is an issue of markets and policy, not an issue of technology. Wow, well, I think that's an excellent note to conclude this talk. Thank you so much, Chris, for joining us. Uh, this has been really enlightening. It's been my pleasure. Thank you so much for the invitation. I really appreciate it. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you everyone for joining and we hope that you'll join us for our next seminar.